Today we're talking to Brad Bashan, CEO of Home Love Construction. Brad is one of Tampa's most successful general contractors, offering kitchen remodeling, bathroom remodeling, and more. Let's find out how Brad went from West Point grad to CEO of his own company, doing more than nine million in business per year. You could just set up to where you pay them a flat monthly fee out of the, the operating revenue of the business. Okay. And you run the business and grow it and start making profits off of it. Sure. So I, I would do that nine times out of 10. They've already got a system that works, right? To some extent. Yeah. They've already got a, cu a customer base. They've already got a trade that they do. They probably have employees who are already trained. Sure. I, I would just jump on something that's already running and, and boost that up and then start. And the other thing is, the thing I wish I had done sooner So Brad, you went to West Point. Can yeah. you tell us about that experience? Yeah, so uh, the the West Point experience is funny. Um, once you graduated from West Point, you're what's called an old grad. It's like a right. technical term. And uh, we, we joke that West Point is a great place to be from. All right. <laughs> so it's tough while you're there. Sure. Uh, but, but the lessons are priceless. So like, you know, they'll take like me at the time, 18 year old kid, had a faux hawk like up to here. Right. And literally day one, boom, they shave it off and boom, you're, you're in boot camp. Like you're right. doing push ups, you're, you're running around and doing stuff, carrying heavy things. Uh, and what it does is it actually allows you to see what's important and what's not. Sure. Like that's, that's the biggest thing that I kind of like realized when I actually got in the army is I'm like, oh my gosh, all this stuff that I thought was important actually is not. Like it, it doesn't really matter how much you know, obviously it's, it's important to take care of yourself, but like what I look like when I'm getting a job done is not important as important as getting the job done. Sure. You know, so uh, things like that, like getting down to the, the bare essentials and then leadership, like the leadership, uh, just basics that they imbue into people are, sure. are super, super valuable. Like it's a bit of an old school education, but it's sure. valuable, man. Has that leadership experience translated into your business directly? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Because if you look at a construction site, like we're on a job site right now, there's probably on a job this size, 100 or 200 individual people involved in this. Okay. So as a leader, and, and it's me, like this is my name is, is on this because I'm I'm the, the top dog in the company. Sure. So it's, so it's like anything goes wrong, it's Brad did it wrong. Right. So <clears throat> what you have to be able to do is is as a leader, and, and this is actually something that is taught at West Point in maybe in roundabout ways and sometimes in, in more direct ways, is how to take your intention as a leader, maybe up here, and go several echelons below you okay. through, a, through a chain of command and get them to do what you need them to do. And that is something that, man, like that's, that's tough. Like people struggle with that. Sure. Like I, sometimes I'll have employees and I'm like, hey, we need to get that guy to do blah. Right. Whatever it is, pick up something. Sure. Some people can't do it. They, you know, it's just like, they just can't get someone else to do something. So yeah. that skill of getting other people to get the work done in a way that's good for both parties. Sure. Obviously, it, it can't be, it's not freaking slavery. Right. Uh, but that is like a critical, critical tool that I, I, that started for me at West Point and it's been vitally important. Well, did you know when you were coming out of the army that you wanted to go into contracting or when did that <laughs> kind of manifest itself? Dude, not at all. I laugh because it's like so far from what I thought okay. I would be doing. Uh, I'm not unhappy doing it. Sure. Uh, but. Like I literally, like my kind of game plan was like, go work at a hedge fund, then become like a famous hedge fund manager. That was like, <laughs> right. like big, like Wall Street finance. Yeah. And I kind of had to make a decision when I was getting out of the army. Uh, like, do I want to go and work on Wall Street or do I want to help my family? Cause this is actually my family's business. Okay. So I decided to go the family business route and it's been awesome. So even though it's a family business, did you encounter any challenges when you were first like becoming integrated into the family business? Uh, yeah, the biggest challenge was that I thought I knew everything and I didn't know anything. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, I was 20, 22, 23 years old, I think. And, um, yeah, I just thought I knew everything. Sure. I was like, well, you need to do this, this, and this, and then you'll be successful. Right. And then, so my dad actually gave me a lot of leeway and he was like, okay, we'll do it. Show me. Nice. And I did it. And some of it worked and some of it did not work. Okay. And so I immediately got kind of hit in the face with like, oh dude, maybe you don't know as much as you think you do. And then I kind of actually started digging in and I'm like, okay, what don't I know here? Sure. Yeah. So uh, those reviews are a huge part of acquiring new business, yeah, right? Dude, 
Yeah. What, what other methods do you use to acquire new clients? Yeah, so our, well, our biggest one is just doing like what we're doing here today. Like sure. Getting in front of new people. Like okay. that, that's, that's the simple principle, but tactically, uh, you have to put out a lot of content. Like for us, sure. we shoot uh, on a weekly basis. We're probably shooting about 40 to 50 short form videos every okay. week. Wow. Probably five or six uh, longer form videos okay. every week. So like just bam, like day in and day out. So obviously it takes some man hours to get those edited and actually sure. posted. But once you get into a groove, it, it can be pretty smooth. And, and you just, the, the message out can't ever stop. Sure. That's, that's the, that's the, the, the way the game works. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's, that's what's worked for me and, and for our business. Nice. Yeah. So one of the things I noticed about your company was you have impeccable reviews online. Oh dude. Nice. How have you managed that process? Because yeah. the internet, you know, you can get a lot of, you know, bad reviews on there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you dig, there are bad reviews. Sure. Like if you dig, there's bad reviews on anybody. So right. my, what, what I tell my team is like, guys, don't ever focus on the bad review. Focus on getting 10 good reviews for every bad review that you get. Okay. You know what I mean? Like I, we, we just focus so much on like, okay, how can we service you better? Like how, and, and there are some people who are just gonna be unhappy. Sure. But there are some people who are always gonna be happy. Right. So we look at like, for example, like we're on this job site, the owner of this job site has already left us a couple positive reviews. That's the okay. other thing is people nice. aren't thinking big enough about reviews. Like our goal is 10 five-star reviews for every client that we have. Okay. Like, cause think about it. You've got a Google account. Your mom's got a Google account. You've yeah. probably got, you might actually have three Google accounts, right? right? right. You can leave a review on Google from each one of those. Yeah. Then you can go to Yelp, then you can go to Facebook. So I, we're just trying to like multiply and, and actually like think bigger about that. Sure. And once you get over the fear of asking, most clients are like, yeah, I'll leave, I'll just copy and paste on all the other platforms. Then boom, you've got five from the same client. Nice. Yeah. Well, so you've acquired a new client through the methods yeah. you use of content and things like that. Mm -hmm. What is the initial design process and consultation look like with that new client? Yeah. So we do, it's honestly, it's actually pretty sick. So, okay. so we've, we've refined this down to like, so we, we have uh, six estimators right now. So, so a sales team of six. Okay. Um, and for our, that's probably bigger than it needs to be for a company sure. our size, but it's because we're trying to grow that front end. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about growing the business, but that's, that's where it starts is growing the front end. Sure. Sales. And so the process is like consultation over the phone, 30 minutes, we call it a, a discovery call. It's kind of like pull the string and find out everything about the project. Okay. And then we go and do what we call an instant estimate. That's the next step okay. in somebody's home. We do an instant estimate, like boom, right there. You've got a price for your project Nice. on the first appointment, which okay. we're already weeks ahead of any competition because sure. everybody's like, let me go see it and then I'll get back to you. Right. We don't do what we'll get back to you. Like okay. That, those are banned words in our company. <laughs> <All right. laughs> like we do it now. Yeah. So we go and we do an instant estimate and then right there we give the person the opportunity to buy a design from us. Okay. So, you know, we, uh, about a year and a half ago, we brought design in house. Oh, nice. Because we found we were referring it out and, and or subbing it out and whatever and it just, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't smooth. Sure. We would have people drop off or they wouldn't get what they wanted. So. We decided to take more responsibility, and and frankly, it's not a money maker. It, but it's a, it's a feed. It's a it's a feed of new business. Okay. So we we brought the design in house, and so that's where they start. Boom, they get the design, and then we're able to usually get a, a contract on that design within two or three weeks. We contract it. We get an engineer. We go to permanent. Nice. So even with the best design and 3D models yeah. and things like that, sometimes people have a hard time imagining in their mind what it, yeah. you know, the project will look like. Yeah. Do you ever run into conflicts um, through the at, you know, in the design process with either function or style? Uh, and how do you deal with those you know, in a client in the midst of working on the job? Yeah, yeah so what, what we find is that most people, they put too little attention on function. Okay. during the design process. That's, that's just something that I've found. Okay. So our design process is really, really about like, what are you using this for? And we even sometimes will remind the client during the design process, sure. of, look, you told us you're gonna use it for this. Now we're not trying to make you wrong, but you told us this, we wanna make sure we're giving you what you actually want. And you're gonna be happy with it at the end. Sure. Cause some people will design something that won't work in the real world, like it won't work well. Sure. Um, so, so we take a very heavy advisory role in that and the other thing is you know you said visualizing it and not being able to really see it yeah our design process ends like the last step is a photorealistic 
the 3D rendering. Okay, including nice. Including like the exact tile they're gonna use, the paint color, the like, Typically, we even try to get the furniture they're planning on buying okay. and literally just do a, a computer generated image, but it's sick. It's like a photo nice. and they can see what it looks like. And we call that basically a visual contract Okay. of like, okay, this is what this job needs to look like when it's done. Sure. And we can show it to the trades guys. So like, yeah. hey man, look, if you're not building to this, you might not be doing the right thing. Yeah. So it makes it, it makes it smoother. A lot of our viewers are people that are considering going into contracting or another trade. Yeah. Uh, someone that's done it themselves, you, yeah, do yeah. you have any piece of advice to offer to them for someone that's just looking to get started? Here is what I would do if it was me and I was like starting sure. from zero, is I would try to take over someone's existing business. I would not start from zero. I would not, okay. I would not come up with my own name. Right. I would not start my own business. Because because here here's the, here's the thing, there's, thousands of contract just in the Tampa Bay area where we are right now sure there's thousands of contractors right you could find somebody who when we were talking about this earlier is like you could find somebody who's a little old a little tired ready to, ready to ready to take it off right sure you could just set up to where you pay them a flat monthly fee out of the the operating revenue of the business okay and you run the business and grow it and start making profits off of it sure so I, I would do that nine times out of ten they've already got a system that works right? To some extent, yeah. they've already got a, cu a customer base. They've already got a trade that they do. They probably have employees who are already trained. Sure. I, I would just jump on something that's already running and, and boost that up and then start. And the other thing is the thing I wish I had done sooner, like we're just starting this now, Sure. is I wish I had started expanding horizontally. Like next month we'll have our plumbing division open. Okay. I should have done that years ago. Okay. You know, it's like, I, I I'm like, kicking myself because right. I'm like, dude, why did you take so long doing that? Yeah. So I would get into that once, once you have your initial thing stable and like consistently, I mean, it, it, it should be consistently, not just like this consistently growing. Sure. Um, and then you can, you can take on more stuff. Are you looking to start a new business or to grow an existing business? If so, check out the heavy ape course, which shows contractors and tradesmen how to grow a business that generates millions of dollars per year. We'll put a link in the description below. Since you've started in contracting, can you think back on one job that was cha super challenging for you and yeah. you know, tell us about that? I mean, that, like it's a great project and it's, and it's going really well. Sure. Uh, but there've been challenges, man. Like the, there, there are things that, uh, so this was one that was not designed by us. It was designed by another firm who actually I really love and I, and I like the owners a lot. Um, and they did a really good job. But there's so many intricacies to this project that, um, like I'll just give you an example. Sure. So one thing we're doing here is we're taking a house with eight foot ceilings and we're putting a portion of it at 10 foot. Okay. Whenever you change ceiling height, a lot of stuff changes, sure. like a lot of different stuff. So we're having to, to account for that and we're finding a lot of little things where it's like, oh man, okay, well, yeah, we got to frame up in here and you got to add block over here and you got to make sure that this pipe goes up the two foot extra. Sure. And so uh, just that, and, and we've done that on a couple other additions that we've done. Like we are, our bread and butter project is room room additions. Okay. Uh, so whenever, and a lot of people want to go, they're like, hey, I want to add it on, but I want to have big high ceilings. So when you do that, you add a lot of complication to the building process and there's sure. just a lot of little details. And then also on this project, uh, we have structural steel, which is always like another level because you got to right. be able to get it in you know, you gotta be able to basically drive a forklift in here and pick this stuff up or right. a crane. Sure. And then uh, you gotta get it welded and then you gotta make sure everything else attaches to it correctly. And once that's in, it's not moving. Yeah. So it's like, put it in the right place the first time. Nice. So that's, th this uh, has by far been our most challenging project that we've done. Sure. But it's also the most fun. Like you can just walk around here, like before yeah, we amazing. started shooting, it's like, okay, this is gonna be great when it's done. You can already see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you can share with us about your experience as a contractor or for people that are looking to get in the industry? Any words of wisdom? Yeah, so here, here's the, my biggest thing, like what our mission at Home Love Construction is actually to uh, spur the construction industry to rise to higher standards. Okay. This is our product as an organization is build some amazing sh do it ethically right. and do it in a way that spurs other people to want to get up on that on that high standard okay okay so for other people is don't be afraid to hold really high standards for your people they will appreciate it okay. they won't be mad at you sure because that is also my number one talent attraction and retention method is when i have a talented person i immediately start telling them 
about our other talented people. Nice. Talented people like being around other talented people. Yep. So have high standards, right? Um, do, do what you know is right, right? And then the other thing is, uh, don't cut your prices, it's never worth it. <laughs> That's just a universal like, don't, don't, ever, don't ever drop your price to get a job. Sure. Um, let, let them shop around and see what else is out there and, and let them come back. You know? Nice. Yeah. Speaking of remodeling, yeah. with your knowledge of the industry, yeah. what are some mistakes that you see other remodeling contractors make that you yeah. try and avoid when you're going into a remodel job? Well, why don't I just tell you the ones that I've made? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that it's, probably, it's probably way more than anybody else has made, right? sure. by my estimation. I'd say the, the biggest thing is uh, not covering your bases in your contract. Okay. So the dude, the contract is like that, that is gold on paper. Sure. Um, if your contract is written wrong, you can put yourself in, in some hot water. Okay. So that, so that's the first thing is, is uh, get your contract reviewed. Often. All right. The second thing would be, um, be honest with your client about what could and probably will go wrong. Okay. If there's something that's going to be a big challenge on a project, we, we don't hot, at first I would, I would be like, okay, I'm going to just make this go right. And I'm not going to say anything to the client. Sure. Now we tell them like, Hey man, we're, we're going to do everything we can about this. Sure. I know it's going to be a problem and this is probably what's going to happen. So I'm planning for that. And if it doesn't, then we can talk about how it was easier than we thought. Sure. So th that's, I, my phrase for that is estimation of effort. Okay. You know, like estimate the correct amount of effort that it's going to take to get something done. And then, um, you know, the other, the other mistake that I've made is, is, uh, cutting my prices. That's, okay. And, and really that's, that's actually a big mistake that contractors make is they don't leave themselves any wiggle room to take care of, of, of anything. Unforeseen circumstances. Unforeseen circumstances. Sure. Exactly. And, uh, there are unforeseen circumstances like legitimately mm -hmm. that the client is not responsible for the contractor is sure. You know? Yeah. So it's, uh, if, if it's not in your contract and the price of block doubles, it's, it's not the client's problem. Man. Right. It's your problem. Right. So, stuff like that you know it's it's really largely about the contract and and planning and making sure that uh you're planning liberally since we're talking about subcontractors yeah. do you have any methodology that you use for finding reliable subcontractors to work with you yeah yeah absolutely so pro probably by the time people are seeing this i actually have launched a course on this entire subject of, okay of getting subcontractors that really work well with you. Nice. Because it is one of the biggest challenges. Like most GCs that I know who are like, for me, uh, I'm what's called a paper contractor. Okay. So I, I get a contract and then I push the paper out to all the different trades and then bring them all together and make sure they work. Sure. Right. <clears throat> Some people will call that a middleman, but technically speaking, that is a contractor's right. job. Sure. Like literally that is actually the contractor's job. So, and you're, you're the shield between the client and the subcontractor, you know, okay. like you, you're there to be responsible for them. Sure. Make sure no one gets hurt on either side. Right. So in deal back to your, to your question, like finding subcontractors that work well with you, it, frankly, it is a numbers game. Okay. <clears throat> like the framing crew that we have here, we've worked with them for probably like three or four years now. Okay. We've gone through 10, 15, 20 different framing crews okay. until we got this one where it's like, okay, this is our guy that it's run by a guy named Brian. He's freaking amazing sure his dudes really know their stuff all right uh and, and it's great but we had to go through people to get to that so you know the the thing is you're gonna need more than you think sure is, is the sim the simple thing there okay um and then stringent tight uh really hardcore uh standards are the next thing is, okay is you have to make it clear up front like look i have very high standards and and if you do not meet them you're going to have to meet them. Sure. <laughs> There's just right. no other option. Yeah. And once you're clear on that, then like, okay, great. I love working on these projects. They're always tight. They're always good. The other work is good. I know people aren't messing around because when you take somebody who can perform and you put them in an environment with somebody who isn't performing, that brings their morale down. Okay. Yeah. So like the framers here, they know the block is perfect. They sure. know the steel is perfect, you know, so they, they know that everything else is, is going to be good. Right. Yeah. Can you give us an example of one sure. thing that didn't work in the beginning for you? Yeah, one thing that was really, uh, I thought it was like, this is the way it had to be, was I thought that we needed to have a lot of uh, in-house labor for okay. our construction company. Sure. And this is just a really like super specific thing to sure. like the contracting industry. But I thought we needed, uh, you know, I call them like hammer swingers, you know, like okay. people actually doing the work in the field. 
And my dad was like, well, why can't we just use more subcontractors? So I was like, no, 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 we need to be able to control the schedules and have employees and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it's turned out that now we're 100% subcontractors. Okay. So, so my dad turned out being, dad, you were right. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, that was one thing where it, it took me like two or three years to actually get it figured out. But sure. once we did, then stuff started flowing smooth. You talked about a numbers game with subcontractors. Yeah. Are you building kind of like a backbench of subcontractors so that it's like, if we, if this one doesn't work out that I've got B, C and D to go down to? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we, we call it our subcontractor army actually. Okay. There, there's literally, so like we have a, we have a, a board, we call it an organizing board sure. in our office where it shows all the positions and stuff. Okay. And it shows like the basic duties of each position. And our the guy that handles our subcontractors, one of his jobs is build the subcontractor army. Okay. Because we, we know like for the for the volume of business we want to do, we need an army of subcontractors to yeah. handle it all. Do you guys do new construction and obviously we're standing amongst a remodel, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so we do. So most of our business is remodel, Okay. Uh, but we do do a little bit of new construction and it's mostly like, we, we don't really do track homes, which okay. a track home is like, you know, model, model, model. Sure. Uh, we, we do custom things, okay. you know, like custom custom home builds, but uh, the majority of it is remodel because okay. there's so much uh, existing housing stock in the Tampa Bay area and it's, oh, yeah. oh, it's all old. Yeah. What do you do today to continue to sharpen the skills that you're using on yeah. the job? Yeah, so I mean, one thing is I'm I'm always looking to expand my viewpoint on like, okay, what A, what's possible? Like sure. <clears throat> when I see a job where somebody has taken the entire back wall of an old house and made it all glass, I'm like, damn, how did they do that? I'm like, <laughs> right. how did, first, how did they get the client to agree to pay for it? Right. Then I'm like, how did they actually do it? Because because the, the building methods are all nice and good, but if you sure. don't have somebody to pay for it, it doesn't matter. Right. So I'm like, damn, how did that guy get, get somebody to pay like $200,000 just to put glass on the back of a house? <laughs> right. So one is to expand, expand the viewpoint of what's possible, right? So like I, I have contractor friends. I, I try to really uh, stay in company with contractors who are, who are doing bigger and better things than me. Okay. Right. So like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get around those people because they lift, they lift your viewpoint of what's possible. And like, if I look at me five years ago, the amount of crap that I took back then, just to be blunt, is like nothing compared to what I'll take now. But right. these guys, the, the amount of crap they'll take is nothing compared to what I will right, right now. So I'm always like, oh my God, I need to keep keep leveling up. So that's sure. one thing is getting around people who are at a higher level. That That is like, if there was just one piece of advice, like that would be it. It's like, get around people who, are, who have bigger businesses, bigger projects, bigger margins, uh, and, and just, watch what they do because sure. it's, it's successful. Figure out how you can use it in, in your business. Well, how has contracting changed in the time that you've been in the industry? How is it different from when you started? Oh man. So the cool thing about construction is it, the methods don't change very often Okay. at all. And that frustrates some people, um, but it's because they don't realize that once you set up to build a house a certain way, it's hard to change. So, sure. so one thing actually that hasn't changed is the building methods. Okay. Um, I'd say the thing that has changed is being able to use software and cloud-based things like Google Drive. I mean, honestly, we run almost our whole business in Google Drive. Okay. Like just just having like simple online tools makes sure. it, I can just jump on my phone and I can look up, okay, what's the budget for the trusses here? Or like, what's the budget for blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's that, okay. Let, you, okay, 50 bucks less than that, we're good. Do sure. It. So uh, having access to information has allowed us to like really speed things up a lot. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about this house you're working on? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a super fun project. It, it really consists of uh, three major things. Okay. We're, we're doing an entire interior remodel. <clears throat> so the normal things that go into that are, are bathrooms, you know, gutted and, and redone. Sure. Kitchen, a little bit moved and, and totally new cabinets and everything. Uh, and then we're also doing a uh, kind of a, a, an outside remodel of like a deck and porch kind of thing. Okay. And then we're adding a second floor to the back portion. Nice. Yeah. So the, the other thing that we're doing is you can see some trusses are up in the front here. Sure. We actually totally uh, refaced the front of this home because now it's going to have uh, a second story back there. You know, the, the second story is not up yet. You know, sure. We'll see the floor trusses back there. But we wanted to add some character to the front of the house. So we added, you know, obviously it's got to tie back into the house and we're literally in the middle of framing right now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so we're, what we're doing is we're totally changing the look of this house as you come up on it. Sure. And we're 
we're actually doing things to it to add uh, what we call like architectural detail. Okay. Right. So like you could do this project and you could just boom slap a second story on it, no problem, yeah. easy. But when you're doing a project of this magnitude, you want to actually add in some little design pieces that make it more interesting as you, you're actually coming up to it, right? Because sure. people don't want to live in a box. Right. They want to live in a house. Curb appeal, right? Curb appeal. Yeah. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. So so we're adding a lot of space, but also some curb appeal as well. Very nice. Yeah. The the first place to start, and by the way, just so you know, people might not be familiar with a job site. This is what a job site looks like sure. when, it's, when it's going. Like this is actually a relatively clean job site too. All right. And there's like stuff everywhere. I mean, just like you're just moving. So uh, the first thing to look at is is the view of sure. the lake behind us, right? This is amazing. Yeah. Um, and and these huge windows. So one thing that that the homeowner here really wanted is he wanted to capitalize on the view without sacrificing uh, the structure because we actually did have an old. Uh, kind of crappy Florida room here. Okay. So we built this up to 10 feet with block walls, nice. right? We've got these, I mean, I can stand in this. This is like a, a six foot tall, I'm right. six foot. So these are these are gonna be huge casement windows, which casement windows open like this. Sure. So uh, they're gonna be able to get a lot of air in here and totally unobstructed view of the lake. Nice. That's that's the first thing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, really, the, the second thing is this whole area this is basically their new living area. Okay. So so this is going to be continuous all the way back to the kitchen. Sure. And this area, this whole part now has 10 foot ceilings, whereas the original house only had eight foot. Okay. So that that's created a lot of complications in, sure. in the actual build. Uh, but in order to hold this second story up, we also had to actually add some structural steel, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Okay. But this is going to have like a, basically a big tray ceiling. Um, if you see that, that, girder truss across there is going to actually it, see how it's sitting lower than the rest of the trusses sure so that's actually going to be hidden in a faux wood beam okay yeah so we're going to do one across and then two the full length to kind of like what they're going for is uh, a bit of a lake house but like a country lake house because okay. we're actually kind of in the sticks here like sure. when you drove out here i know we talked about how it's disorienting getting here yeah so uh, they're going for a bit of country lake house so we're gonna have some real wood accents which is gonna be super nice that's awesome yeah if I'm being honest, the steel on this project is a little much. All right. But, you know, it's what the engineer called for. And at the end of the day, you do what the engineer says. Sure. So so this thing right here, it's it's now encased in wood. So you can only see the bottom and top of it. But this is actually a uh, 16 inch by 12 inch wide steel I-beam. This thing weighs, uh, I think the total weight on this was about 3,500 pounds. Wow. And it's 50 feet long. It goes okay. the, the full length of, of the building. Sure. And it's got six by six steel posts about every 25 feet. Okay. And then we have its little baby brother over here, which uh, is gonna support this old roof. And really what the reason, cause I actually asked the engineer at some point, I was like, dude, can we drop the steel? Like, do we have to do this? Sure. Cause it's not cheap. Yeah. And uh, he was like, listen, the, the reason you need the steel is actually to stiffen the structure. Cause we took out so many load bearing walls that the whole thing, like a house, you know, a house doesn't just have to stand up straight up and down, right? Right. A house actually has to stand up to wind, pushing it and twisting it. Sure. So this steel, the steel is so rigid that it's actually a stiffening. Uh, it's actually have a, having a stiffening effect on the whole thing. So that's that's okay. why it's there. It's, uh, you know, and, and it was it was surprising to me. I thought that the steel would be a bigger ordeal than it was. It went up super fast and nice. it's, it actually, you know, we were commenting on it earlier. It makes it during the construction phase look more rustic. It's like, oh, an old steel beam. And I was like, no, that's brand new steel. <laughs> it's nice. just rusty. This slab that we're standing on, these these are actually uh, part of our our second second story deck here. So we're gonna be building on a, on a second story. Uh, it's gonna be a waterproof porch that okay. you can walk out on top of, or you can sit under. Nice. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna have wood. It's gonna be like a like Trex decking, you sure. know, like up up top. And then uh, this is this is kind of a I'll tell you. But don't don't tell anybody else. Don't tell the city. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> when we're done, after we pass our final inspection, I promise the the owner that we're gonna build uh, actually a zip line from here down into the lake because we have a perfect shot to go right past that tree. Nice. And uh, we're gonna literally just build like an L-shaped bracket off and go right, boom, right into the lake.